This is a re-edited and re-uploaded version of this video reviewing and summarizing prescription murder. At the very end of this video, I will explain why. Please enjoy. Prescription Murder first aired February 20th, 1968. In this video, I will be discussing different facts, observations, and trivia throughout this episode while summarizing the story. There will be spoilers all along if you haven't already seen this episode of Columbo. This particular story already existed eight years earlier, originally called Enough Rope, and the role of Columbo was played by Burt Freed, who is known for playing Sergeant Bullanger in the 1957 film Paths of Glory, and he also played the role of Schmidt in the 1968 film Hang Em High. Enough Rope was an episode of the Chevy Mystery Show, which was a TV anthology series. In 1962, that episode became a stage play titled Prescription Murder starring Thomas Mitchell as Columbo. You may recognize him as Uncle Billy from It's a Wonderful Life, or maybe as Gerald O'Hara from Gone with the Wind. This story and the character Columbo was created by Richard Levinson and William Link. The play was adapted as a made-for-TV movie in 1968, with Peter Falk debuting in the role. Falk is mainly known for being Lieutenant Columbo, but he acted in several movies, some of which include the 1976 film Murder by Death, where he played Sam Diamond, the 1987 film Wings of Desire, and he played himself, the 1987 film The Princess Bride, playing as the grandfather, the 1978 film The Cheap Detective, playing Lou Peckinpah, and he also made an appearance in the 1963 film It's a Mad, 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 Mad World, as a cab driver. Even though this episode, along with the next episode, is referred to as the pilot episode, it wasn't intended to be such. Prescription Murder was only meant to be what it was, a TV movie. The episode was directed by Richard Irving, known also for directing The Name of the Game TV series and The Six Million Dollar Man. Columbo popularized the inverted mystery technique by showing the crime first and then having Columbo solve it. Instead of who done it, Columbo is said to be a how catch him. In other words, how is he gonna catch him? So we've been watching here a very unique and interesting opening credits with a backdrop of Rorschach tests, also known as ink block tests, which is very fitting since one of our main characters is a psychiatrist. The movie opens with a party. There's a group of people playing what they call Botticelli. The basic gist of this game is that one person thinks of a famous person and reveals the first letter of their name. The game takes its name from the principle that the famous person must be at least as famous as Sandro Botticelli. And here is where we meet one of our main characters, Dr. Ray Fleming, played by Jean Barry. Jean Barry is known for playing in the 1953 film The War of the Worlds as Dr. Clayton Forrester, also the 2005 film War of the Worlds. He plays the grandfather. He is also in the Burke's Law TV series, playing Captain Amos Burke, and the Name of the Game TV series, where he plays Glenn Howard. Watching from the sidelines is Dr. Fleming's wife, Carol, played by Nina Foch, who is known for her 1951 film American in Paris, where she plays Milo Roberts. The 1956 epic, The Ten Commandments, she plays Bathia. The 1960 film, Spartacus, where she plays Helena Glabers, and the 1945 film My Name is Julia Ross, where she plays Julia Ross. We learn that it is their 10-year wedding anniversary as this really smoky cake rolls into the main room. After their friend gives a toast to their anniversary, you'll hear applause from the guests, but if you look, nobody is clapping. Here's to 10 more years of happiness. <laughs> The phone rings and it is supposedly a patient of Dr. Fleming's. It seems urgent enough that he insists he must leave his wife alone on their anniversary with a home full of guests. And as she watches him walk away, she's got a very good idea of what he's really up to. Then the scene cuts to some little philodendron prancing out of the pool into Dr. Fleming's arms. Now our story is really unfolding. This girl's having second thoughts about some alternative to talking to his wife about her. We learn she really was originally just a patient of his who seemed to be having anxiety problems. I won't disappoint you tomorrow. I never thought you would. So something is going on tomorrow that seems to have been planned for a while. 
And as the scene cuts back to his wife, Carol, waiting up for him and pacing with worry and anger on her face, as well as sunglasses for some reason, he shows up at one in the morning. She informs him he is sleeping in the guest room and she is calling her lawyers in the morning. Six months ago, I gave you a choice between me and your extracurricular activity. So likely he has been planning something for six months. He's been fooling around for quite some time and his wife has given him chances to straighten up, but he refuses. Now he's got a new lie ready, that he was planning a trip to Acapulco for their anniversary and that's why he's been out so long. She wants to believe him so desperately that she buries her anger in hopes of the chance that he could be telling the truth. So the girlfriend's name is Joan Hudson, played by Catherine Justice. She's known for 1985's Simon and Simon, where she plays Donna Bertoli, and also 1968's Five Card Stud. She plays Nora Evers. She comes to visit Dr. Fleming's office for her appointment, where they run down the plan for that night. The scene cuts to Ray and Carol talking about getting prepared to leave for their trip. She specifically mentions not being able to find her blue wool dress because she wants to take it for the trip. Seems like it'd be a bit warm and tropical for a wool dress, but fashion is fashion. This blue wool dress happens to be the one Dr. Fleming takes for Joan to wear to carry out their plan this evening. Carol acts oblivious to his coldness towards her and her excitement. He really should be also behaving very excited for the trip. He begins to sneak up behind her while she's talking and about to do the deed, when she suddenly turns to him and talks about wanting to redecorate. He suggests she should close the blinds, and once she turns to do so, he grabs her around the neck. The phone begins to ring while he's strangling her, which certainly increases the suspense here. Once he believes he has killed her, he casually answers the phone and carries on a simple, pleasant small talk. After hanging up, he needs to make this look like a crime scene, so he takes a huge candle holder, and if you look behind him, you can clearly see a shadow in the night sky, and just look at the intense force he needs to break the sliding door. Also, it is notable that the glass likely fell onto the body, which should be a sign to investigators that she was dead before the door was broken. And another thing, they're in the penthouse, which is practically almost the top of the building. I guess the burglar was supposed to scale his way down from the roof onto their balcony. I really like the music that plays during the scene, though. The music was composed by Dave Grusin. He has composed many scores for feature films and television. So he starts taking off her jewelry, gathering up the silver in the house and the rest of the jewelry from the other room. Then Joan shows up and rushes into the room. Seeing dead Carol on the floor makes her recoil in fear. Ray has her call the cleaners about picking up laundry that will be outside the door. Oh, looks like a nice piece of evidence left behind. This will surely be an open and shut case. Oh, never mind. We learn his luggage is 13 pounds overweight, which we all know why that is, because he seems to think dumping the stolen goods in Acapulco is the best plan. Now, Ray and Joan, who's playing as Carol, stage an argument in order for her to storm off the plane. This entire group of passengers were just busy staring at them, and the lady in the back seems very amused by this. However, oh, now he's got a little alibi in Acapulco. Miguel, why don't you fix us some lunch? I'm starving. Go make some lunch three feet behind me while I toss all this overboard. Ray gets back from his vacation in Acapulco, walks into his apartment, and sees the sliding door has some interesting repair work, and there is an outline of Carol on the floor. And here strolls in Columbo. Peter Falk was 40 years old here. The only thing really different between this outfit and his outfit for the rest of the series is his shoes. Rather than his high top of brown shoes, he's got on some hush puppies. Hush puppy shoes got their name from the actual food because dogs were quieted with the cornbread snack. Knowing that aching feet were sometimes referred to as barking dogs, the shoe innovator thought hush puppies would be a good name for the shoe. Interestingly, the hush puppy shoe mascot is a basset hound, which some of us may already know that Columbo will get a dog in later episodes that is a basset hound. Anyway, back to Columbo, whose first words are, Dr. Fleming? Columbo informs Dr. Fleming that someone tried to kill his wife. Yes, she is still alive, but in a coma. 
which makes me question why they took the time to outline her body before rushing her to the hospital. He does a decent job pretending to be concerned for his wife, but we know he is a uh, much more concerned about himself. Now here they are at the hospital, and Dr. Fleming is demanding to see his wife, which is understandable. We see that Columbo is holding his raincoat rather than wearing it for now. Columbo's iconic wardrobe was all Peter Falk's clothes, the raincoat, the suit, the brown shoes, and the rest of the episodes, excluding this one. I read that Falk bought the raincoat when he was caught in a rainstorm in New York in 1967. It cost him $15. Here is his first act of being unable to find a pencil, and mentioning his wife, and look at that pocket full of cigars. Oh, oh, one more thing before I forget. And there was Columbo's first one more thing. According to Richard Levinson, the catchphrase, one more thing, was conceived when he and William Link were writing a play. He says, we had a scene that was too short, and we had already had Columbo make his exit. We were too lazy to retype the scene, so we had him come back in and say, oh, just one more thing. It was never planned. And here comes Bert Gordon, who we met at the anniversary party. Bert is played by William Wyndham. He is known for his 1989 role in Uncle Buck as the voice of Mr. Hatfield. Also, he played in 1962's To Kill a Mockingbird as Mr. Gilmer. And in 1971's Escape from Planet of the Apes, where he played the president. Bert decides he needs to have a little talk with Columbo about speeding up the case. Columbo mentions that Dr. Fleming didn't call out to his wife when he first came in the door. Bert gives a reasonable explanation for that. You heard the man admit that he had an argument with his wife. He probably still had a chip on his shoulder this morning. They head up to the room that Carol Fleming is in, but nobody is allowed in because we learn that she's conscious. But then, the next thing we learn, she died. Changing scenes to Dr. Fleming's office. Maybe take note of that painting back there for a future episode. Dr. Fleming wants to know why he is here, and Columbo uses the excuse of just returning his pen he borrowed. And check out the size of that lighter. Columbo questions about the missing weight of nine pounds, which we know was a bunch of silver and jewelry. But Fleming says he had some journals he had brought for reading, but he had no reason to bring them back. Then Columbo wants to know what happened to the dress his wife was wearing, and Dr. Fleming suggests it was probably stolen. Still, it's puzzling when you think about it. I'm, I mean, why would a guy steal a dress and a pair of gloves? What are they worth? Not quite as puzzling nowadays. As Columbo leaves, he crosses paths with Joan, who is waiting in line to see Dr. Fleming, and he asks her her name. Then she heads into Dr. Fleming's office. He asks her if she put the dress and the gloves back in the laundry bag. Joan realizes she forgot the gloves. Then Fleming suggests she bring the gloves to his place for him to plant so Columbo can find them. This is kind of a silly thing to do since Columbo is coming over later. He could have instead picked them up at her place or anywhere else. So now here we are back at Fleming's apartment. Joan shows up with the gloves. He offers her a drink as if they have all the time in the world. He should instead be getting rid of her immediately. Joan asks why Columbo is still bothering him. Fleming says it's because Carol's death has been too perfect and it irritates Columbo. Why he'd even look for flaws in the Old Testament. I think that's kind of a funny line. Speaking of the Old Testament, Fleming needs to brush up on Exodus, specifically Exodus chapter 20 verse 13. Then there are odd noises coming from the door. Joan runs and hides in a closet. Oh look, it's Columbo! Showing up early. So Fleming hands over the gloves, stating they were in the bureau. Columbo is puzzled by this because the cops covered every inch of that bureau. Then the doorbell rings and it's the Rodeo Cleaners boy. Well, here is the dress. Suddenly the phone rings. Somebody is confessing to Carol's murder. How odd. This fella here confessing to the murder, Tommy, is played by Anthony James, who is known for playing Skinny Du Bois in the 1992's Unforgiven, Hector Savage in the 1991's The Naked Gun, Two and a Half, The Smell of Fear, and he also played Ralph in the 1967 film In the Heat of the Night. Columbo asks some questions to Dr. Fleming that make him sound pretty suspicious of him. This causes Fleming to talk to his DA buddy, Bert, to see if he can get Columbo off of his case. 
Columbo lets Dr. Fleming know he was taken off the case and he just doesn't understand why. By the way, this is the first time we see Columbo wearing his raincoat. Anyway, while in his office, Dr. Fleming says the strangest thing to Columbo. You're a sly little elf and you should be sitting under your own private little toadstool. Dr. Fleming gives a perfect outline of Columbo here. You're an intelligent man, Columbo, but you hide it. You pretend you're something you're not. You take people by surprise. They underestimate you. And that's where you trip them up. When Columbo and Fleming sit down and talk, their dialogue is very sharp and very interesting things are said. The conversation is so deep that Dr. Fleming can't help but spill his drink while he's talking. Here's Columbo innocently opening a popsicle and casually dropping the wrapper on the ground. He's got a briefcase with him today, likely because he doesn't have his raincoat to hold things in his pockets, and it might also be a helpful prop to intimidate Little Miss Hudson. This is a very good scene with very good acting from each of them. This is the scene that gets commonly mentioned about Columbo being much more intense than his character typically would act throughout the series. In general, Columbo is a very calm man, but even as the series continues, there are moments here and there where Columbo has to lay down the law. Joan really slips up here when she mentions he has no right to order her around because he isn't even on the case anymore. She shouldn't have known that. We learn that he has not been taken off the case because his superior believes if someone is asking him to be taken off the case, then he must be on the right track. Columbo really nails Joan down with some heavy evidence and some forceful volume here. Then Columbo lets Joan know that he is going to get to Dr. Fleming through her by hounding her until she breaks. There are police watching her house, and she calls up Fleming and asks him to please come over, which is really dumb. Ray gives her a real good response, though. We have men watching your house. Joan, use your head. The next morning, when Joan doesn't show up for her appointment, Fleming tells his secretary to call her, and a coroner answers. That's not good. Dr. Fleming goes to her house and sees police and an ambulance. He gets to the pool, and we see a limp redhead getting picked up and put on a stretcher. Columbo tells him she stuffed herself with barbiturates. By the way, this house is called the Stall House. It's a modernist styled house designed by architect Pierre Koenig in the Hollywood Hills of Los Angeles, California, which is known as a frequent set location in American films. Columbo lets Fleming know he has no way to nail him for murdering his wife, even though he knows he did it. But now it seems he has gone through all this trouble of murdering his wife and everything for nothing, since the love of his life is dead now. Dr. Fleming claims she was just a dime a dozen little actress. Nothing special. And then surprise, Joan is totally alive. And now, after hearing Fleming's little speech about not needing her and never loving her, she is ready to confess. And Columbo still doesn't have a pencil. I think this is an outstanding TV movie. The acting is great, the sets are great, the story and the directing is great. I rate it five Columbo cigars out of five. So just like Prescription Murder is considered one of the pilots for the Columbo series, even though it wasn't intended to be a pilot, this video is my pilot episode for a potential series of observation, trivia, and facts for all the Columbo episodes. If you got any enjoyment out of this video, stick around. Subscribe if you want. Hopefully I'll be making more. This video was originally uploaded on February 20th, 2021. Three weeks after the upload, I got copyright claims, so I deleted it, re-edited it, and uploaded it. Three weeks later, I got another copyright claim. Then I figured, okay, well, I'll edit within the YouTube system and just cut out the 10 seconds it's having a problem with. So I did that. Then immediately after it was done processing for a whole two hours, it gave me another 10 seconds, and then 9 seconds of something else, and then 7 seconds of something else. Every time I trimmed out a section that it kept claiming, it would claim another section, and continually claim 5 seconds here, 8 seconds here, over and over again, until my video was butchered. The video was still able to be seen by anybody who was not in the United States and was not in Canada. But I am from the United States, so I want my, my United States people to see it. And then my Canadian neighbors, they should be able to see it. So I re-edited this video with a lot more, a lot more still shots, a lot more pictures put in, and it's just faster in general. I like this version. I've spent so many hours editing the same video over and over again that I'm sick of this video. I would love to do a new video, but I'm not going to until I find out this video is not going to have a giant copyright claim on it throughout the whole thing. So 
thank you for sticking with me through all of this. And I am grateful for my Columbo enthusiasts. Hopefully see you later.